So my name is Samuel Moore. I'm a research fellow um, in the Department of Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry University. Um, I'm interested in um, information studies. I'm a, a researcher of open access publishing. I'm a practitioner of open access publishing. And I'm particularly interested in ways in which open access might be able to nurture new forms of ethical and experimental cultures of, uh, within humanities publishing. At the, the start of the, the open access movement, um, so in my research, I guess the, the open access movement, I, I sort of try to understand it as having a, a number of different um, origins. Um, it's, it's got its roots often thought of in the sciences, um, particularly we have um, physicists sharing working papers from as early as the 70s, really, via the internet, the email, and then FTP servers. Um, and that's still a really common tradition today where they, they share their research before it's peer reviewed. Um, and then you have the biological sciences where they have popularized kind of the article processing charge um, form of publishing. Um, but my research tries to locate the sort of the humanities role in this um, uh, in, in the origins of open access. And so how I do that is by going back to the, the original web based journals of the early 90s. Um, now we have journals called um, Postmodern Culture and surfaces and what they were doing is a kind of sharing free research doing it as a public good before the um before scientists were really sort of thinking about it as an open access movement so you have quite an interesting um genealogy of, of open access that is um, both from the sciences and from the humanities and the social sciences and that's kind of converging and it's always converging and, and going further apart again um, and so, so ultimately what that means is that the values of the open access movement are quite sort of multipolar. Um, you have on the one hand, a push towards commercialization from sort of big publishers who have seen it as a market opportunity, but then you also have the sort of not-for-profit, more politicized angle of perhaps the humanities, the social sciences, but also some scientific publishers as well. And so, um, and so how that sort of manifested, the, the actual beginnings of the open access movement were the, the BOAI, the Budapest Open Access Initiative. And, um, and that's often considered the first sort of the founding document that, that defined open access. Um, but what I want to do is just sort of look at that a bit broader and say, actually, the origins are a bit more complicated than that. And so actually, humanities and social science researchers had quite an important role to play from the beginning and before the beginning. The values of, of the open access movement, and I guess the open science, they, they, there is a link there between open forms of publication and then the open software, or so the open source software movement, and in particular the free software movement. It's probably not worth going into too much detail about what the differences between those movements are, but essentially open source software is uh, quite an apolitical movement, or at least they try to be apolitical, whereas the free software movement is more about um, engaging with the, the politics behind software creation. And you actually see that within the open access movement as well. On the one hand, you have people who look at open access as merely a means to an end of this kind of sharing research and, and making research more efficient because you're sharing it with one another. And there's no real political connotation there. It's just a kind of, um, this is the efficient way of distributing research that we want to do. And on the other hand, perhaps more the area that I want to sort of align myself with is, is free software and then the more political side of, of open access that does look at um, open access as a sort of a gift to the readership, but that's one that's founded on a politics that, um, I mean, for myself, the publishing industry has not um, served the, the research community in the way that it should do. And so um, open access is a way of I maybe regaining control in that regard of, of publishing or forcing publishers to do something a bit more different or um, bringing publishing back in-house from the commercial publishing industry. One thing it's worth emphasizing is that open access and open science is not necessarily um, a political movement, or at least it's not necessarily an emancipatory movement or um, a left wing, a progressive movement. It's just, if you look at it from the sort of, from its basis, it's getting research out to a different public and removing paywalls to research.
And so if you look at it from that perspective, you can quite easily see that it can be co-opted for any different political ends. And so in my own research, I've looked at um, the neoliberalism within open access and particularly how the big publishers, who we often call the, the oligopoly of publishing, because there are five who control the majority of the vast majority of publishing themselves, how they've managed to sort of take open access and monetize it and do exactly what they did with closed access publishing. And now what they're doing is kind of alongside with with um, oftentimes with policymakers and governments, they are um, locking them into these sort of transformative agreements. And what these agreements do is they allow people to publish for free, but they also do so at an extortionate price. And so the the profit margins of of the big publishers, um, if anything, they're 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 going up. I would imagine from open access, they're certainly not going down. There's no there's, but there is a political angle there that that they are taking upwards of 25, 30 percent net profit margins. And so the open access movement has an angle there where it's either on the one hand about giving research to people for free, removing paywalls. Or it's about the politics of that and how libraries can no longer afford subscriptions and how they will no longer be able to afford article processing charges or transformative agreements. And so there's this continual interplay that that open access, the values of open access are actually quite different depending on what your politics are. And so um, so there is this neoliberal streak throughout open access, but there's also a more radical or progressive streak as well. And it's um, and it's kind of my task I see as, as trying to at least nurture the more the more progressive side of things. Um, so, so in my research, I am interested in what's called scholar-led publishing. Um, now, scholar-led publishing is um, literally what it sounds like, which is scholars just doing the work of publishing for themselves. It's a way for them to, to do the whole thing themselves, the typesetting, the journal hosting, the sharing, etc. Um, and in my research, I locate sort of the scholar-led movement and the open access movement quite early on in um, the early 90s cultures of the different journals who share um, humanities and social science work and so what I um, they they were using the um, the web in sort of quite an early fashion and FTP before that and they found very quickly that they could publish research and this hadn't really been done before because they you needed to have expensive publishing networks in order to do this but um, but the scholar-led publishers and that tradition has carried on through from the 90s through the 2000s to now. And it's a very rich tradition of the open access movement. Um, and I'm not saying with my arguments in favor of scholar-led publishing that all publishing should be managed entirely by working academics because there is a publishing industry that can do that. But what I want to identify is that there is a lot of value there to scholars publishing their own work. Now that could just be because they can do it in a different way. They can do it in a way that is exactly how they want the research to be published. They don't have to conform necessarily with the pre-existing conditions of publishing. Or it could just simply be <clears throat> that it's fun and it's easy and it's it's interesting. There's a whole sort of range of, of, of reasons. And so scholar-led publishing is, um, is a very important strand of the open access movement. It's not the only one, but it's, it's one that I sort of value very highly. Like the, in the early days of the internet, scholar-led publishers were sort of experimenting with publishing for the first time and what they were doing because because the technology was so new and was so they didn't have things like kind of um sort of css and and like expensive publishing software to be able to to um publish articles professionally so most of the stuff is sort of plain text thrown up on the web or thrown up via um email lists and that was sort of how they were they were sharing their research now there wasn't much in the way of um, and sort of new practices there. The new practice was the fact that it was scholar-led. That was the important thing. It was done without recourse to publishers. And so, but as we've seen, um, sort of the, the evolution of scholar-led publishing has been one that from the early days of this plain text publishing, you now have forms of publishing which are kind of highly experimental, where publishers would never really get involved with some of the work that um the the scholar-led publishers are getting involved with because it's there's no value in it for them there's no they either can't do it because it's too expensive or they can't do it because they can't sell it and that's the that's the sort of the issue there and so as the the scholar-led movement evolved you have journals like um um Scalar, um, which is a sort of publishing software for doing 
multi-modal forms of publishing, born digital forms. Um, and that's all run by scholars themselves. It comes out of USC. There are there are a number of different sort of forms of software and and but it's not just a software based thing it's also a a sort of practice so you have collaborative forms of, of publishing where collaborative publishing was never valued in the humanities that that highly anyway um you also have kind of images and texts being used in a way that have never really been kind of done in a sort of um in a born digital sort of multi-linear um fashion and so scholar publishing i guess it just allows you to to do what what it is you you kind of want to do with publishing it's not necessarily there's no preconditions there it's just saying if you don't have to rely on someone else to publish your stuff you can do it however you want to and we have the skills in academia to do that and we have the the skills as well to sort of conceptualize that and so if you can marry these two together that's what i think is is a value proposition of scholar led publishing so one of the things that is often i guess forgotten about with the open access movement is that we are making research openly accessible to a public to the public or a public um and the reason that's forgotten is because our open access is often reduced to a business model how can we make things kind of cheaper or how can we kind of get rid of subscriptions etc but it, but ultimately it's, it's predicated on the web um on web-based technologies that are openly accessible to all and so what open access does um, is it allows you to um, position your research to a sort of different audiences. Traditionally, in the humanities at least, we write for quite a narrow um, audience of often just a handful of people in your field. Um, and so open access and scholar-led publishing in particular kind of gives you the impetus to, to think about your audience in a different way. Um, if you look at traditional publishing networks, there's no real incentive for them to kind of care about um, broader publics because they are prestigious often and the prestige is the thing that keeps them going. Um, whereas if we're kind of sort of circumventing them or going around them, we can then sort of publish again for how exactly how we want to do that. And so with um, the collective that I'm part of, which is called the Radical Open Access Collective, who are a group of scholar-led publishers, what you see with them is a lot of them release their research via blogs or a lot of them release research that is um, particularly accessible for um, political reasons or artistic reasons. And, and so automatically you're, you're kind of expanding the reach of your research and you're expanding who, who you think kind of would be interested in it. Um, certainly in today's kind of um, sort of politicized world or the, the, the way the world is, we need these kinds of things to get out to people. We need humanities research to get out to beyond just the ivory towers of academia. And open access is one way of doing that, but it, it requires the incentive for people to actually do it. It's not just a, a precondition. It's not, if you publish open access with an Elsevier or a Wiley journal, there's no real difference to publishing with within a subscription journal with the same publisher. You still need to actually go that step further, I think. Um, so, so the question as to whether or not scholar-led publishing should be the sort of standard form of publishing and that we should get rid of, of the sort of the, the publishing industry, essentially. Um, I mean, you could do that. You could, you could definitely get rid of publishing industry and have academics releasing their own research. Um, but obviously there's, there are technical requirements there that are quite important around archiving and preservation and certain standards, metadata, all these things exist for a reason. And so if you are to, to get rid of the kind of commercial publishing industry, which I'm kind of not that wedded to, I don't mind getting rid of that, you still need to bring it in-house in a more professionalized way. I mean, we have university presses already. We have other publishing um, kind of uh, publishing bodies within the, um, the academy within libraries in particular that can do this kind of stuff. And so you don't, the question isn't really whether or not we should get rid of the commercial publishing industry. It's more like, how can we get them to either conform to the standards that we want to do and where they can't do that, can we bring these things in-house? Now, I'm very keen to not devalue the labor of, of technologists and publishers because it is, publishing is a skill. I'm a publisher, I've, I've done it for over a decade but it's still something which um, is kind of not really being done right in many ways at the moment. And so, so that's kind of what the open access movement is about for me is bringing it in house, seeing what things that we can do, valuing that labor, 
and then kicking things back out to publishers who are then accountable to us. And that's sort of what I see as the sort of future of the open access movement. Um, so the Radical Open Access Collective is um, an organization of uh, over 70 member presses, um, and they all are scholar-led, they are in the humanities and social sciences, they are not-for-profit, and they publish kind of books, journals, experimental publications. And so they're a network of publishers rather than kind of one big publisher itself. And so what we see the Radical Open Access Collective doing is supporting one another through what we call mutual reliance um, and scaling small. Now, scaling small means um, rather than having one massive publisher that doing all of the work of publishing, we have a network of small publishers who look after one another and they share resources and they share their time and they share their expertise. Ideally, they share funding as well where it's available. And then once you have that, then you, you have quite a big organization filled with a diversity of individual projects who then are able to sort of push back on the traditional publishing industry. And in fact, they kind of act as a sort of a counter hegemonic project to the publishing industry because they're big and they're noticeable, but they're still filled with these small scale publishers. And so the Radical Open Access Collective doesn't, um, we're not, we're, like I'm not involved with the publishing side of things myself. I'm just a facilitator and what I call a sort of an organizer of the collective. And I try to bring them all together. And I try to, and we have a, we have a kind of a coherent philosophy that is kind of, it's very loose, but it's just that you have to be scholar led. You have to be not for profit. And then everything works horizontally. We have no particular hierarchy at all. We have everything's done around a mailing list or a website. And then we go to conferences and share each other's work at conferences and um, and just do those kinds of things, which aims to build sort of mutual reliance around these forms of scholar-led publishing, because scholar-led publishing is precarious. It's inherently precarious because we are doing this all in our free time, basically. So there is a, um, a side of open access that's often associated with, with piracy and kind of less than legal forms of access and copyright infringement. And there's potentially a place for, for those kinds of things. You, you might take a position on copyright that is that it's inherently regressive and it sort of precludes sharing, it precludes innovation in many ways. Um, but you could also look at forms of piracy as holding back the open access movement, whereby if we do rely on these, these networks of Sci-Hub or, or other forms, of even shared via ResearchGate or Academia.edu, then are we actually transforming the publishing industry itself? Um, I don't think I have a, a sort of opinion either way as to whether or not one is better than the other. I just, I don't want to, um, to castigate researchers for using pirate sites when they can't access research via other means. That's what the foundation of the open access movement is, is giving research to people who know who didn't have access. Um, and so um, and so it's a complicated situation. And, I don't, and I'm, I'm certainly not one who says I never sort of pirate things, but also it's probably not the best solution to the publishing industry to, to kind of en masse pirate everything because things don't really kind of change in that regard and things will just sort of stay the same. And, um, and the same publishers will be publishing stuff in the ways that they always have done, and then we can access it via the back door. That just doesn't seem like a, a hugely beneficial solution, but kind of as a sort of a stopgap, then maybe, I guess. Um, one of the main things that's sort of holding back the open access movement is is the is career requirements within the university that we need to publish in certain ways and often in in closed access forms or in open access forms with commercial publishers um i tend not to think that that should be kind of the problem of the open access movement in the sense that it's not up to us to sort of fix that but also we shouldn't really be fixing things to solely encourage open access forms of publishing there are much broader problems with the academy than than just um, closed access. And so a better way to think of it is that open access can form part of a struggle against the sort of neoliberal university and the conditions of the university to, um, to sort of ask more and more of us and to ask us to publish in certain ways. And so 
that's a that's a really helpful thing that the open access movement can do but it has to be part of this this broader struggle um, and ultimately we need to be pushing for more funding for universities now open access can't um by itself it can't get more funding for for universities but it could form sort of part of that solution and it could show governments what sort of um the benefits of sharing open research could be um yeah i think i'll leave it there So my PhD was about um, the tension in the open access movement between scholar-led publishers that I sort of talk about quite a lot, and then the policy landscape, the open access policy landscape. Um, and so how I look at the, the policy landscape is that open access um, is being used as a sort of, um, as, as a thing to kind of make research more efficient by governments. And so what they do is they're saying, if we fund your research, then you have to make it publicly accessible, which is definitely a good thing. There's, there's no sort of question that, that research should be yeah, made freely available if it's being funded by public money. The problem there is that they're using open access as the, as the end point rather than the beginning. And so what they're doing is saying, we're going to make, we're going to free up a bunch of money for APCs, or book processing charges in order to allow researchers to publish in the same ways they always were doing, but just making their research open access. Now that doesn't seem to be a particularly kind of good um, mechanism for encouraging kind of ethical forms of publishing or new or exciting or sort of all the good stuff about open access is kind of left out there. And then you also have to take the, the kind of our understanding that open access um, is often something for a class of researchers who receive quite a lot of funding. In the humanities, I think something like one or two percent of, um, of public money goes towards the humanities. And so research grants are actually quite hard to come by. And so if you are mandating open access in this way and you're freeing up public money to do it, you're actually kind of leaving the humanities out in many ways. And so there's a, there's a difficulty with the policy landscape and certainly the, the policy landscape right now, which is um, dominated by an, uh, an initiative called Plan S, which is a network of European funders. And it's this really big, um, radical kind of proposal to, to change how um, public money is used for publishing. Um, but ultimately, it's, it doesn't really change that much because it's just funneling public money to the publishers via these APCs and nothing really changes. Now, I think Plan S at least are taking on the criticism of the fact that it, nothing much changed and they are sort of trying to support scholar-led publishing or not-for-profit or what's often called diamond forms of publishing and so um and so the the policy landscape is important and it can definitely get involved but it has to get involved beyond open access it can't just say if you get a million pounds or whatever to to um, do your research then you have to use three thousand pounds of that to, to make your article available that's just just seems like a ridiculous suggestion really it has to be much more kind of transformative than that. So one thing that the open access movement um, is sort of stimulating is this turn towards um, new forms of open infrastructures for supporting open access. And kind of what open infrastructure often entails is um, governance and particularly governance by the the actors the stakeholders who are affected by publishing so it's not just governance by the market so i'm involved with um, an initiative called the copin project which is the community-led open publishing infrastructures for monographs publish uh, projects and it's a publicly funded um, project here in the uk and what we seek to do is build the infrastructures in order to allow new publishers to publish open access books and to generate revenue for doing that and to essentially support the whole life cycle from sort of beginning to end of, of monograph publishing. And one thing that's particularly, yeah, which I'm involved with is the governance side of things where if we're bringing publishing back from the market, particularly book publishing, um, how do we govern these efforts and how do we ensure that they're accountable and how do we ensure that um, they sort of stay accountable for the long term? So that's the sort of the future of open access will be one that's not actually just about making stuff freely available. It's about the actual infrastructures behind publishing and how we can kind of make them more ethical, 
or not for profits or nurtured sort of cultures of of experimentation um, in in publishing sort of beyond what we what we have at the moment. So there's there's often an association in kind of the debates around open access that that open access is a sort of scientific thing. Um, and it does have origins in the sciences in some ways. It has origins in in many, all the different disciplines, actually. But the sciences have really kind of popularized it. Um, and what you see is in throughout the mid 2000s, you have the popularization of open access via these commercial publishers um, like PLOS or Biomed Central, um, who popularized the article processing charge um, business model. And that really took off within the actual traditional publishers, the, the Natures, the Elseviers, et cetera. Um, and so that's reached this situation now where a lot of money is funneled from the public to these large commercial publishers. And then the humanities all along have not really been engaged with by the sciences, or we've just been doing our own thing. And um, But the interesting thing that's happening now is that humanities in the form of things like Open Library of Humanities, have found a way to make open access work from a, a business perspective by asking libraries for small amounts of money in order to publish research um, kind of on, a, on an annual basis. And so what you see now is that the sciences are kind of trying to replicate that model. They're actually taking from the humanities and they're trying to bring back the, the, the work of, of humanities researchers and bring it into, into their own disciplines which is kind of, it just shows that the humanities have always been there and we've always been kind of under the surface and bubbling under and then people like to take from us and they like to kind of do what they want with it, which I guess is fine, um, but it just shows that um, sort of how important it has been to have a different non-commercial approach to open access all along. Um, and so for humanities, for scholars of the humanities, um, I, I guess I'd like to say that it's sort of, uh, you should see yourself as, as being part of this, this tradition um, and that our research is actually in many ways more accessible in a sense of more understandable by the public or more relevant to the public, particularly from a political perspective, from a cultural perspective, all of these things. And so I think that that's one of the reasons you should, as a humanities researcher, get involved with the open access movement is because it's a way for making a pretty good case for why we are so important and then showing that. And that isn't just about making things freely available. It's about doing it as a way that's, um, that's kind of, um, that allows the public to access your research and do stuff with it. It's not just sort of read it and then forget about it. It's difficult as as an early career researcher myself. I've struggled with the fact that I'm an open access advocate, and I am judged by the standards often of closed access publishing. And so I have had to publish in subscription journals, and I've had to to do things in a way that I perhaps wouldn't really want to. Um, but the realities are that that the academic job market, um, at least in the UK, is so fierce that I have to publish in the correct places in order to um, to get a job. Um, open access can't change that. Um, that's that's a, a sort of a bigger push and it's a bigger movement and it's one which I very much like to sort of support. But what I also want to say is that um, that publishing strategies for early career researchers, they're not like a zero sum game. You don't have to only publish open access or only publish closed access. And so I always make my research freely available, even if I published it in a subscription journal, I might make it available through a repository or, or various other non-legal means. Um, and there's value there in doing that. Um, whereas you still have to publish kind of to keep up with your own sort of career, I guess. And so if you have to do that, that's fine. That's that's an act of self-defense, which we all have to do. There's, there should be no one sort of beating you up for publishing in a way that furthers your own career. However, the open access movement at least gives you the opportunity to understand kind of the political economy of publishing and why you're doing what you're doing and who the good actors are, who the bad ones are, and, and how kind of we could change this system if we all work together. And so one of the ways that um, early career researchers could get involved with um, the more radical open access elements would be possibly even to, to join them, to, to try and review for them or to try and help them out. Bearing in mind, they're all scholar led. You're a scholar. Um, 
you could copy edit for a journal, you could um, sort of help out with marketing and those kinds of things, or you could simply just support them by buying their print books. Often radical open access publishers will have open access versions of their books, but they'll have print versions. And so there's various ways that you can support them. Um, and the way to do that, I think, is just to sort of acknowledge them and to, to amplify them where possible and certainly share the work of them kind of with your networks. And they are always um, interested in hearing from people who would like to work with them. So do not ever be shy about getting in touch with the publisher who you'd like to help out, because by all means, I'm sure that they would accept that. <laughs>